اليوم الأول الجلسة الثالثة بعنوان الثورة الرقمية وحفظ التراث الثقافي الأفريقي لدينا المقطع ثلاث باحثين من أفريقيا الدكتورة عظيم محمد أحمد الخطي
بس في الاشياء العاديه اللي هي التكست والمسج والكلام لا ده كمان بيستخدموه في مجالات اخرى حياتيه يعني. من الواقع التكنولوجي ايضا ان في حوالي 200 شركه ناشئه في كينيا في مجال التكنولوجيا الرقميه وبجانب الشركات العالميه زي اي بي ام وانتل ومايكروسوفت. المحور الثاني بيتكلم عن المجالات اللي بتتعامل في التكنولوجيا الرقميه في كينيا واساسها اولها اللي هو مجال تحويل الاموال. في تطبيق اسمه امبيسا كنت بتكلم امبارح مع صديقه كينيه وقالت لي يعني اكدت لي اللي انا كنت كاتباه في الورقه ان التطبيق ده فعلا بيتم استخدامه بشكل كبير جدا في كينيا بالنسبه لمساله تحويل الاموال. كينيا عن طريق الاوبشن ده او التطبيق ده في حوالي 2% من المواطنين اللي كانوا تحت خط الفقر عندهم يعني تخطوا او تعدوا هذا الخط نتيجه استخدامهم لهذه الخدمه اللي هي خدمه تحويل الاموال. طبعا كانت خدمه تحويل الاموال كانت الاول مرتكزه في البنوك لكن كمان في دلوقتي الشركات اللي هي هيئه الاتصالات والتطبيقات اللي هي ممثله الانجاز. في مجال ايضا اللي هو بيتم استخدام في التكنولوجيا الرقميه اللي هو مجال الحياه البريه. الحياة البرية في برنامج في كينيا الحقيقة بتمويل من الوكالة الدولية الوكالة الأمريكية للتنمية الدولية بيحلي الحياة البرية وبيتم الإبلاغ عن المناطق اللي فيها أزمات أو فيها مشاكل في المحميات الطبيعية اللي موجودة في كينيا كمان في مجال التعليم والحقيقة مجال التعليم في كينيا يعني في يعني محاولة لل محو الاغنيه الرقميه او محو الاغنيه التكنولوجيه من من دوله كينيا او من الحكومه الكينيه عن طريق مشروع بدايته كانت من 2008 اللي هو تعميم استخدام الوسائل التكنولوجيه في المدارس الحكوميه او المدارس في كينيا وعن طريقه تم توزيع حوالي 19000 تابلت في المدارس الابتدائيه وابتدى يتم استخدام التليفون والانترنت في التدريس المناهج التعليميه. في كمان بيقدروا يوصلوا دلوقتي للامتحانات او الدورات التدريبيه عن طريق التكست مسج او الانترنت بان هم بيدفعوا حوالي 10 20 في الاسبوع وبالتالي بيقدر يروح يحصل على الامتحان بتاعه ودي طبعا كان بالنسبه لهم المناطق النائية أو المناطق الريفية التطبيق ده والأوبشن ده بالنسبة لهم الوصول للتعليم كان مهم جدا. في المجال الصحي في تطبيقات أخرى زي إم هيلث وبكتر الكتب أو طبيب في كل مكان عن طريق التطبيقات دي بيتاح استخدام أو الوصول للخدمة الصحية والمستخدم في بيته أو في أي مكان بيتواصل مع متخصصين وأطباء مش أي حد. دي هي المجالات اللي بيتم استخدام التكنولوجيا او الرئيسيه اللي بيتم استخدام التكنولوجيا الرقميه في كينيا فيها. المحور الثالث اللي هو بيركز على اللي هي المبادره اشاهدي او اي ويتنس او انا اشهد المبادره دي بدات في 2008 و2007 اللي هي كانت فتره العنف الانتخابي في كينيا واللي قام بالمبادره دي او التطبيق او المنصه الالكترونيه زي ما أربعة من الشباب في كينيا هم اللي بدأوها وعن طريق التليفون كان أو الرسائل النصية القصيرة ده كان بيتم التبليغ عن المناطق اللي فيها عنف انتخابي في كينيا عن طريق التبليغات دي وتجميعها كان تم رسم خريطة للعنف الانتخابي اللي موجود في أثناء الفترة الانتخابية المبادرة دي ما اكتفتش بعد طبعا من الانتخابات المبادرة دي اتطورت تم تطويرها واصبحت منظمة عالمية غير ربحية مفرغة في كينيا يعني اطفي عليها الطابع المؤسسي المبادرة دي قدمت خدمات لحوالي 160 دولة منهم دول افريقية ودول غير افريقية 
نصب من الدول الافريقية ليبيريا كونغو الديمقراطية والدول الغير افريقية تشيلي خاصة في مسألة الكوارث او الزلازل والكوارث اللي بتحصل على زي ما هو واضح كده كان الهدف من المبادرة هو التمييز عن العنف الانتقالي لكن تم تطويرها وبالتالي استخدموها في اشياء اخرى كثيرة حتى مؤخرا ابتدت المنظمات بعض المنظمات للحفاظ على الحياه البريه يستخدموها في التبليغ عن المشكلات اللي في المحميات الموجوده عندنا. بوصل للمحور الاخير اللي هو في جزئيه التحديات والفرص، من التحديات اللي بتواجه كينيا في نشر التكنولوجيا الرقميه عندها اول حاجه مشكله التمويل طبعا دي مشكله اساسيه. آه مشكلة البنية التحتية طبعا محتاجة بنية تحتية آه يعني تؤهلها للتوسع في هذا المجال آه في مشكلة تغطية الانترنت الانترنت رغم ان هو داخل الاستراتيجية الوطنية لكينيا الا انه لم يعني يصل لكل الاماكن الموجودة في كينيا آه يعني من الفرص المتاحة في كينيا طبعا انها مجال مفتوح للاستثمارات في هذا المجال مجال التكنولوجيا الرقمية وان من المتوقع ان تحصل زي طفرة في سوق الاتصالات في كينيا بحصول عام 2022 ويبقى فيه زي ارباح بتمثل حوالي 3 مليار و9 بالنسبة للتطبيق والشهيدي الفرص المتاحه لي انا بعتقد ان هو ممكن يتم استخدامه فيما يعني فيما بعد او يتم تطبيقه بحيث ان هو يصبح زي نظام انذار مبكر للكوارث او الازمات يعني ان هو فعلا تم استخدامه تجربته في بعض الدول منها زي تشيلي قلت بالنسبه لفرص لكينيا متاحه لكينيا فرص كثيره وهي فعلا دوله واعده بالنسبه لمجال التكنولوجي اعتقد عندهم حاجه دلوقتي زي وادي السلام يعني مشابه في مصر زي القريه السلكيه وحاجه زي كده يعني تجمع للشركات اللي هي مهتمه بالتكنولوجيا. دي كانت ملخص الورقه واتمنى ان انا ما اكونش طولت عليكم وانا اعتقد ان ما خدتش ازيد من الوقت بتاعي يعني انا خدت اقل من الوقت فمشكور يا شكرا دكتورة عبير على الدراسة تناولت تجربة كينيا في توظيف التكنولوجيا لعملية السيطرة وإدارة الأزمات بأشكال مختلفة جدا. تناولت الدراسة مجموعة من المحاضر المحور الأولي. الواقع العام للتكنولوجيا في كينيا. المحور الثاني التطبيقات استخدام التكنولوجيا في توفير الفرص للشباب في العمل وإدارة الحياة البرية. و تطوير او تسهيل التكنولوجيا المعرفيه والتعليم في المدارس. بعد ذلك استخدام التكنولوجيا في عمليه اداره الانتخابات ومحاوله معرفه مناطق النزاع او الصراعات اثناء الانتخابات الكينيه. بعد ذلك خلصت لبعض التحديات اللي تواجه الممارسه نفسها اللي هو استخدام التكنولوجيا في عمليه في في كينيا فواحده من التحديات هو التمويل والبنيه التحتيه وضعف الانترنت في تغطيه مجموعه كبيره جدا من الدوله ومن ضمن الفرص الجيده لاستخدام التكنولوجيا هو اعتبار كينيا قوه اقتصاديه لساحه ومجال مفتوح للاستثمار و استخدام العملية التكنولوجية كعملية إنزاع إدارة الكوارث بشكل مسبق. شكرا دكتورة عبير. ننتقل إلى 
uh, uh, director and editor Oho Ishamboli in Nigeria. Uh, here at Gilden, the Raza, the Anwar. Excuse me. Wasai at Wasal Chimaya, social media, or the team at the Bia, or the Swear and Wami, the Shepherd, and the Waka in the Waka in Nigeria. Totally, I was there and I read that for so that the uh, historical understanding of what pregnancy cycle is in Nigeria is no longer there. It is vanishing, it is disappearing gradually, and then we are keying into uh, the practices, you know, being transferred to us by uh, social media, facilitated by social media, so that um, Prior to contemporary time, what I mean by contemporary time, I'm actually talking about um, the advancement age in information. So that now, when people are pregnant and they're in their third trimester, they go for baby shower, they go for nude photos, and then they put it on social media. And then the question is, what happened? Is it that the evil doers in those days, the world died? so that now people can actually come out and showcase their pregnancy. And then we need to understand culture. I'm not going to go into all of that, but we need to understand that a whole lot has been done on culture, and that is because it has some inherent peculiarities that, have, that define a set of people. And that's what makes the black different from the white. And that's what makes your food different from mine. But we have left all of those things and then we are keying into the Western incursion and the Western hegemony. Oh, sorry, for want of time, that's the introduction. The paper is actually conceived so that I, I can explore the recent development of um, pregnancy uh, culture in Nigeria. And then it argues that African cultures you know, have been challenged by Western incursion, by Western hegemony, so that anything that comes from the West uh, Africa uh, accepted hook, line, and sinker. We saw it in the first session, the presentations that um, we heard of in the first session. And these are the objectives. For want of time, I won't have to go into it, but they are there. And like I said, it's an empirical study, so data was collected qualitatively from two different hospitals from uh, uh, in Lagos State and then in Delta State. Of course, Lagos, because of it's a commercial hub, and then it's like a melting pot. It's like the USA of Nigeria, so we have a whole lot, and then we have this cultural mix and cultural hybridity. Like I said, that uh, the white man doesn't have to come down to Nigeria again before we are influenced. Social media has closed in the gap and closed in time for us, so that you look at these things and then you're able to communicate and relate with the things that happen in the other side of the Atlantic. And then um, when cultures meet, they don't, they don't talk at contact level, they interact and then they influence and then they diffuse. And then when that happens, the, the, the more dominant culture actually influences the less dominant. And that is not to say that the less dominant don't leave strong you know, elements of its own culture in the more dominant cultures. Uh, the methodology, of course, like I said, it's an empirical work. Uh, 20 people participated. Eight from, I mean, eight from Delta State and then 12 from Lagos State. Now, the, 
age range of those people fell between 25 and 40, and it wasn't like it was purposely selected, but it was just coincidental. And that speaks to the fact that um, it covers the, the, the most reproductive age of a woman. And so most of them were between the ages of 25 and 40. Um, uh, though their pictures are on the internet, but they opted for pseudo names because they do not want their names to be tied to their faces in case of um, publication. So um, I won't have to go into literature review so much, but I want to pick uh, on Bellow's uh, definition. A lot, like I said, a lot has been done on culture. I'm picking on him because he said it's the totality of the way of life involved by people. The word involved there is what struck me because it takes care of uh, the historical and the contemporary uh, dynamics that we'll get to see in the changes that occur in culture. Now, African culture has had to go through different phases. The, the, the transatlantic colonialism and then the pre present uh, globalization and modernity that we talk about. But then I need to I need, I need to clear this that okay even before colonialism, Africa interacted with the other uh, uh, with the rest of the world. But the event of the 15th century is uh, critical to the discourse of African history, and that's why it's there as uh, the transatlantic slave trade, colonialism, and then uh, globalization. Now I guess I'll go straight to the data presentation. Why? Because it is key uh, in uh, reiterating the fact that social media has, has a lot of influence in the decisions that people make. And the first reason is for the first reason why people do do uh, engage in this ritual because it's not a ritual, it's not a norm, so that if you do not participate, if you do not partake or engage in a pregnancy photo exhibition, nude photo, maybe nude, total, like, total nudity or partial, uh, it's like your pregnancy cycle is no longer complete. And so for this first participant, she said it's because of, because of the fact that she suffered secondary uh, infertility and it actually led to divorce with her first husband. And then when she got into an, another relationship about two years after, she was able to conceive. So she needed to show to the world that um, she's not married. And then another reason is the fact that she doesn't want anybody to um, bully her child and say that you are an adopted child. Those are, are two main reasons. And then the third one is because it's a trend and then she needs to you know, be receptive of it and move with the trend. So, and that speaks to the fact that in a typical African uh, family, um, the brunt and the pain and the um, heart of uh, infertility actually rests on the woman. Nobody cares about the man. Everybody thinks that it's the woman that is uh, having infertility issues. So that was what happened in that way. So she needed to show. Now, two other particip participants shared the same, um, shared similar uh, narrative. For, except for a uh, different uh, marital status, and then uh, for those ones, they actually suffered um, as, as serial um, uh, miscarriages. So by the time they were able to finally get to the third trimester for this one, they couldn't but engage in nude exhibition. And then there is this one of, um, it's a blend of religious and medical reasons. She was like, it's a despicable artist against her belief and all that, and that her body is reserved for her husband. So the body of a woman, least of all the pregnant one, should not be on the, on the shelf for the display. And that um, for many good reasons, if you really want to prove to the world that you are the owner of your child, you should do a DNA, because that is the most assured way to affirm and ascertain the parenthood of a child. And that, um, and really, in, 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 in the, um, uh, makeup artist, uh, artistry. Uh, one can actually uh, make a, a, uh, I mean, a pregnancy bomb and then it looks real. So if you really want to say you are the parent of a child, then do it here. Yeah. And then this one, ambivalence of practice. She wants to belong to the old and belong to the new, global and local. So she had to, a lot, a lot of my participants actually fell under this category. So she had to uh, observe it but she kept the photos until she delivered because she was still trying to be protective of her baby. And then this one, this one too is similar, but this one uploaded immediately. Um, then this one didn't, up, didn't um, do it, not because she was against it, but because uh, it didn't occur to her. And then she was like, if uh, the opportunity comes again, she would definitely engage in it. 
And uh, uh, well, we, from this study, we'll see that a lot of women are actually keen into uh, nudity, and um, it just boils down to the fact that we tend to we tend to align with the West, anything they bring to us. But we need to begin to see Africa from the perspective of Africa. Thank you. Uh, you are welcome, Mr. Dixon, for your presentation. 
and then I remind you, you have only 10 minutes for presenting your paper. Good evening to you all. Uh, I'm so privileged to be here to have this presentation. I will introduce myself to uh, you. Um, my name is Exnado from Ghana. Yeah, I'm from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Uh, I'm a research scientist there. And um, recently I was appointed as an extraordinary researcher in the Northwest University in South Africa. I'm presenting um, an ongoing study on the digitization of indigenous knowledge, mobile applications of African proverbs for cultural instruction and preservation. I have other collaborators, Joshua Chukwere in the Northwest University, South Africa, Irina Pianina, also in the University of Ghana, and Philip Fodi in the Jala University, Sierra Leone. Since time immemorial, the forebears, our forebears, African forebears, have utilized indigenous knowledge systems and it was a bedrock for their development. But it's quite sad that recognition of indigenous knowledge on a global level as a developmental resource was only discussed in the first global knowledge conference in June 1997. A year after, that is in 1998, the indigenous knowledge, sorry, the World Bank recognized indigenous knowledge, developed several programs for indigenous knowledge. When we talk about indigenous knowledge, what are we referring to? In my earlier work in 2016, I defined indigenous knowledge as an adaptive form of knowledge rooted in the cultural and artistic practices of a group. And it is born out of the numerous experiences of uh, society, and it is relayed from the older members of our society to the younger generation, and is done oral, through oral tradition. Indigenous knowledge is really important because uh, it helps us um, really moral values, sound moral values to the younger generation. There are several forms of indigenous knowledge systems in Africa. The one that this study uh, focuses on is our uh, proverbs. And when we talk about proverbs, they are short, wise phrases of human thought and experience, and is quoted to express wise judgment, didactic teaching, meaningful warning. And it plays a significant role in the education and socialization of our youth. In his recent work in uh, 2015, Chimboto realized that Proverbs have deductive, moral, philosophical, humorous, and even therapeutic functions. But it's sad that indigenous knowledge is fading off, it's getting extinct. Reason being that it is preserved or passed on orally by the older members in our society. And when they pass on, we may lose the indigenous language, including our proverbs. So, Saku Late Eta, in their work in 2017, advised that we need to find ways of preserving our proverbs. Hunter recognizes that we need to take the digital technologies, the emerging uh, digital technologies, and then utilize them for preserving and reading our indigenous knowledge systems to the younger generation. Two key ingredients of digital technologies is that 
they help in preservation as well as enhancing access of knowledge. And this is what we have to tap into in our quest of preserving our indigenous knowledge forms. Now, we have a lot of mobile phones. The youth have mobile phones. So the, the full term of our research was to come out with a development of an app that we can use in teaching our programs. We have some of these apps. Uh, mobile apps in existence, but their strengths are that they are categorized by country, and some of them have offline audio um, renditions for the progress. But the gaps are that they lack a philosophical means. The programs are there all right, but they don't have means. Aside that, they are also scattered. They are not arranged in thematic format. The research questions that drove the study. First, we wanted to identify and categorize the programs under relevant thematic areas. The second was to use the endopragmatic method in unraveling the philosophical beliefs of our programs and then see the potentials of developing mobile application for our progress. The study was conducted in three countries, Ghana, Sierra Leone, and Nigeria. It was rooted in a qualitative, a purely qualitative fashion, and the method was phenomenological because we wanted to gain the lived experiences of participants, especially the older members in the society who are very knowledgeable with the progress. They were selected impossibly, but there were instances where the study participants also led us to other participants. That is why uh, we added the snowballing to the sampling techniques. You know, the sample size was 88, consisting of spokespersons in their traditional cabinets, advisors to chiefs, elders in their traditional cabinets, elderly residents in their study areas, IT experts, religious leaders, and others. The data collection instruments included personal interviews, focus group discussions, telephone interviews, Skype interviews. The phenomenological data that was uh, gathered were analyzed using the interpretative phenomenological analysis, but the philosophical meanings of the progress were taken through the ethnopragmatic method, which consists of three phases. The first being examination of the text, looking at the text construction, its uh, parameological features, and then looking at the cultural context within which the proverb belongs before coming out with the philosophical import of the proverb. Now we've gathered or collected 3,653 proverbs in all, and we collected them from the older members in the study areas. Some, we discreetly collected them through their speech, and The study participants agreed that we need to have our progress in categories. We need to arrange them under specific themes because it will make it easy to learn them and then apply them. These are some of the categories we've gotten so far. Financial management progress, natural resources management progress, leadership progress, developmental progress, motivational, religious health, relationship progress. Now, these are some of the proverbs under financial management pro uh, proverbs. The first one is money has wings. Literally, money is not like a bed with wings, but the philosophical import of this proverb is that if you have money and you don't utilize it well, you, you spend carelessly, you will end up losing it. It will fly off as it were. 
We have other ones, but because of the time, I cannot highlight all of them. Under natural resource management programs, uh, one is a single tree cannot stand the light of a storm wind or storm. Meaning, if we want to destroy, uh, want to loot the resources in our environment, uh, we will end up facing serious environmental reprisals like uh, flooding, earthquakes, and the like. So, it tells us that our proverbs have a lot of benefits, and we need to use. Uh, the digitization initiatives to really them um, to the younger generation. Uh, I will talk briefly about the views that we got from the youth that we interviewed concerning their proverbs, having the proverbs and their meanings and their categories on mobile apps. They said it will ease access to the proverbs and it will make its, their understanding easy, the proverbs. And the older members also said that if we document our proverbs using the mobile app, it will help because many of the proverbs have been adulterated because we are passing them on oral. One of such proverbs is the Akan proverb. The right one is Kwachia Diefa, a discarded alien. If Kwachia's possessions are worth admiring, you should know that they are products of his hard earned money. This very proverb has been adulterated to Kwachia Diefa, a discarded alien, meaning beautiful things along the streets are products of money. But when you look at the philosophical import of this proverb, you would realize that. Is cautioning the youth that uh, Kwache, who is a renowned person back then among the scientists, had possessions of it, but it was born out of hard work. It came out of hard work. So if you also wanted the, the possessions of Kwache, then you need to also work hard. But because we don't have proper ways of preserving these progress, it is resulting in its adulteration. I'm concluding that proverbs have a lot of weight in sustainable development and we need to find ways of preserving them digitally using mobile apps. And the mobile app should categorize the proverbs and then showcase their philosophical meanings for the youth to benefit from them most. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Victor Nixon Adolf, for the nice presentation. I'm uh, a computer company, the Hitop for Amithal uh, al And Teresa, not a lot of Viga, in the latter dual in Australia, in Ghana, Sierra Leone, and Nigeria, for Hitop al Asasi. باعتبار وجود محدد للحجم والمثال الشعبية الأفريقية اللي هو انتقال أو مول كبار السن واعتبار المولود الأفريقي على كبار السن باعتبار انه الدكشنري بتاع المعلومات والحجم فموت كبار السن يعني انقلاب لهذه الحجم والأمثال عشان كده تم ابتداء هذه التجربة كمحاولة لإعادة توثيق الحكم والأمثال ونقلها إلى الأجيال الحديثة الجديدة لوجود استمرارية لتناقل مجبرات المعرفة للأجيال القديمة ونتكلم بقى عن ديناميكية انتقال الحكم الشعبية باعتبار احتمالها بشكل مباشر على الشفاهة وليست الكتابة والتدوين وتم جمع ما يقارب 3000 مثل مختلف 
والانفاق الافريقية هي تتناول كيفية استفادة وإدارة الحياة بشكل أفضل عشان كده نلقى في أمثال العلاقة بالدين العلاقة بالعمل الجماعي العلاقة بالاستفادة من الثروات الموجودة في المنطقة الاستفادة من احترام الآباء والبركات من يعني مختلف الأشياء التي علاقة بالحياة ولكن الهدف الأساسي هو كيفية إدارة الحياة بشكل أمثل ومن ضمن نتائج الدراسة هي أن الحكم والأمثال الإفريقية تحتوي على مجموعة مقدرة من القيم والمبادئ اللي يمكن الأجيال الجديدة أن تستفيد منها عبر التوصيل الشفاهي عبر وسائل التكنولوجيا. Thank you for Nixon Adom for the nice presentation. الآن the floor is open for the discussion. So you're welcome for the comment or question. Thank you. السلام عليكم. صلاح ديس من أسوان. شخصية عامة طبعا من أسوان. السلام عليكم. السلام صلاح ديس من أسوان. شخصية عامة طبعا. إحنا طبعا بنرحب بالمؤتمر دوت وبنشكر وزارة الثقافة. اللي عملت لنا المؤتمر دوت وعلى راسهم السيده وزيره الثقافه والسيد معالي الامين العام وفي المجلس الاعلى للثقافه اللي عملوا لنا المؤتمر الجميل ده احسن من التقي باشقائنا الافارقه واخواتنا. طبعا نخش في السؤال انا عايزين نعرف افريقيا طبعا فيها فيها حضاره كبيره وفيها عادات وتقاليد افريقيه عريقه. عملتوا ايه عشان توثقوا الكلام ده عشان يتوثق عشان الاجيال الشابه تعرف اجدادها اجدادها كانوا عاداتهم ازاي وتقاليدهم الاصيله هل توثقوا الكلام ده عملتوا توثيق؟ شكرا شكرا كبير انا سعيد بموضوع هذه الجلسه لانه يعطي الامل اقول لك ازاي من خمس سنين انا كنت في هارفيسا وبعدين جلست على مطعم ومعي احد الاصدقاء من صوماليا وفوجئت انه عمل ماني ترانسفير ودفع في ذلك الوقت انا كنت في الخليج ما كانش الموبايل ماني ترانسفير موجود ف طبقا لبيانات 2017 في عندي 160 مليون حساب اكتف على الموبايل ماني ترانسفير بمعدل تعاملات شهري 20 مليار دولار في افريقيا وبالتالي تساوي 60% من جمله التعاملات الموبايل ماني ترانسفير في العالم فانا بقول انه التعامل مع متغيرات الثوره الرقميه بالنسبه لافريقيا اسهل من الثورات الصناعيه السابقه وبالتالي ممكن ان نحجز لما دول انه اللي اتقال في غانا مثلا في تطبيقات استخدام الاب في عمل الامثال الامثال الشعبيه والتوثيقه ده نموذج الافارقه في عندهم نوع من الاوبسيشن الاستخدام الحب دي استخدام ادوات جديده لو احنا خدنا انه 60% من السكان في افريقيا هم تحت سن 25 سنه اللي هم اكثر قدره على التعامل مع الثوره الرقميه بيعطينا ايضا امل في احداث تحول كبير في المستقبل. سنه 2100 2100 هيبقى افريقيا فيها اكبر دي تقديرات الامم المتحده اكبر كتله بشريه في العالم يعني تلك سكان العالم هيبقوا موجودين في افريقيا معظمهم في المدن وبالتالي واحنا قلنا 60% شباب اصلا فاحنا ده كله بيعطينا ما هي ما هو موقع افريقيا في اطار الثوره 
الرقمية أو الثورة الصناعية الجديدة. أعتقد الواجب علينا الآن هو العمل المبدع الذي يساعد على الانوفيشن. يعني أصبح الآن وخصوصا ده موجه للشباب مش قصة النجاح بس، يعني إن أنا أروح المدرسة وأحقق مجموع عالي عشان يبقى عندك قدرة على التنافس لا بد ان يكون عندك قدره على الابداع الابداع ده يحتاج مهارات اوروبا عندها خوف كبير جدا من الثوره الرقميه لانه في جوبز في وظائف هتنتهي ويتخلق وظائف جديده وبالتالي ما هو هدفنا لرفع التعليم بالكارير او السوق وتنميه هذه المهارات لدى الشباب. اعتقد ده هو التحدي اللي لابد ان نستثمر فيه وده الاستثمار من اجل المستقبل اللي احنا تحدثنا فيه في الجلسه السابقه شكرا جزيلا. انا دكتور اسماعيل حمد سبيشاليست اوف افريكان هيستوري اند ميديفال تايم. ثانك يو سو ماتش مارك فريد اوفر جاست اند بايدي فور يور سبيشال بريزيدنسي اوف بوليس اند ثانك يو سو ماتش فور ذا سيشنز Okay, I have your special uh, presentation and we're happy to, uh, to see such a group of uh, African researchers from different uh, places. So my question to Dr. Dixon, please. I try to understand the terminology of ethno-pragmatic. I try for this, please try uh, to articulate the meaning of this, what's the meaning of this, because I'm um, disturbed of the meaning. Okay, so I'll try to Show us what you mean of this and how do you uh, use that terminology in your research. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Rachel Yana from Kenya, and uh, I'll, I'll still impressed by the, uh, the first presenter's presentation about Kenya because what she's talking about is uh, largely. Uh, quite true, and uh, I think that there are just a few areas that you probably need to think about as you as you expand your your research. And uh, I think the very most uh, the, the most interesting is the latest innovation in the digital uh, revolution in Kenya. Just uh, follow up on something called Fuliza, F U L I Z A, Fuliza. It's the latest whereby you can you, you, you don't have to have money in your phone because basically everything is done on the phone. You don't need to go to the bank, you don't need to go anywhere at all in, in, in Kenya. <laughs> yes, that's what I'm telling you. That's true. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I, I do that myself. I don't go to the bank at all. <laughs> uh, and so, but the only thing is that you have to get money into your phone first. So you can get money from the bank to the phone, into the phone, and then use it to transfer. However, when you don't have money in your phone, you don't have money in your bank, you can still get money from Fuliza. It's more than a loan. So it's something that is very exciting. I think it's really something we need to do. about is uh, the fact that the concept of digital uh, digital revolution has been taken to another contextual level whereby it's just not about the digital as it is as we know it as, in, as, uh, as the meaning that we know but it goes into a different concept of new or concept of newness freshness so you find that someone is getting a second wife and he says I want digital I don't want <laughs> so the concept is going beyond that Probably something you want to mention because also it has been used politically. That we are going, we are, we are, did you want to have a digital president or a analog president? So the concept is moving beyond what it denotes. So it's something you probably want us to think about. Uh, my question 
question is for uh, Professor Omo. And uh, you were talking about a very exciting topic about uh, a woman's body and uh, during the pregnancy and how they uh, come out to show their bodies and that they are proud of uh, pregnancy. And uh, you have given also a historical survey that women in the past in Africa, they were afraid to go out, especially in the time of uh, the time of pregnancy, fearing the evil and this type of mythology and this type of myth concerning the woman's body. And you think that the uh, digital age has uh, played an important role in uh, making the woman uh, bodies as a three to, to show and uh, to speak about it, or still there are certain uh, uh, constraints and uh, fetters concerning the woman. Body. And uh, for me, for example, my own personal experience, uh, when I start looking at Africa, for example, uh, nudity and uh, people who are nude in uh, pictures and photos, especially in the uh, publication published by the Western society, that they show that uh, nudity is something normal among the women job and, uh, and that a woman carries uh, a woman carries her child and breastfeeding this is normal. So what is new about putting this nudity on uh, on Facebook or social media aspects or Thank you. Do you think? Uh, yeah. Thank you. 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 بس Uh, 
And uh, in particular, inquiring how the scientifically arrived at your sample size, 88, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Shukran for the Muda'alat and Asila. We don't have time, please, sorry. We just remain with five minutes. So we continue our time. أنا هذه كل المحاضرين مساحة دقيقة دقيقة للإجابة ونحاول إننا نستفيد من السرعة في تداول الأشياء. هذا طوال جدا. زي ما قلت الكيبر مشروع فيها يعني بتاعتي شرحة كل الاختصارات اللي سألت عليها اعتقد هتقريها او لو تحب ان انا ارسمها لك تقريبا هيكون فيها كل الاجابات اللي انت سالتي عليها. بالنسبه لحضرتك، حضرتك سالتي الاول على الناس اللي كانوا تحت الخط انا قلت بالتحديد انا فاكره اللي انا قلته انه تم اخراجهم من خط الفقر 2% من المواطنين في كينيا تم اخراجهم من خط الفقر نتيجه تحولات ماليه. تحولات ماليه حضرتك يعني هم كانوا فقراء جدا وما عندهمش اي اموال لا ياكلوا ولا يشربوا عن طريق تحويل الاموال ليهم من عوائلهم مثلا في في الخارج او داخل الدوله نفسهم هم بيبقوا في الغالب في القرى والمناطق النائيه فتم تحويل الاموال دي ليهم فبالتالي قدروا ان هم يستخدموها في المعايش بتاعتهم فعشان كده تخطوا عدوا صناعات من البنوك اللي بتعمل دوله امريكا للموبايل البنوك يعني حضرتك استخدام الثورة الرقمية وتأثيرها على الوعي لدى الأفراد. في عشان سؤال؟ السؤال الثاني حضرتك بتسألي على المبادرة أو منصة أوشاليدي. أوشاليدي دي يعني أبلكيشن أو أبلكيشن هنقول أبلكيشن ده بيبقى في فترة العنف الداخلي في كينيا. أربعة شباب اللي اتفرجوا. فحضرتك بتسألي تقدم في إيه؟ التقدم في الابتكار لأنها كانت سابقة وقتها وتم استخدامها في دول جديدة. التقدم حضرتك في الاستخدام لأن مش بس استخدمت في الهدف اللي هم اللي هو تم إنشائها من أجله، لا تم تطويرها واستخدامها في مجالات أخرى. أوكي. وصلت. شكرا.
spearheaded by Godak in 2006. And it has three different phases. The first phase has to do with examination of the text. Um, and under that, you look at the text construction. Is it literal or commutative? Then you look at the uh, parabiological um, um, features, whether it fits into the category of proverbs. Is it concise? Is it uh, pregnant with, uh, with wise? I mean, is it in integrated with wise thoughts? Does it even qualify as a proverb? Before you then move on to the cultural context. Cultural context because we believe that, uh, or we accept that the proverbs have their roots in the cultures of a group or a society. And many of them are tied to uh, true life stories and sometimes the cultural values in the society. So you have to find out the cultural context. Like uh, there is this proverb among the accounts of Ghana. It says, uh, <laughs> if our chin, our chin is the name of a, a renowned scholar, but then in Chromer's time, if our chain is unable to attend a social gathering, his letter does. So the, the cultural context for this very proof is that our chain was somebody, a renowned scholar, who lived, who actually lived in the Congress time. And they placed premium, high premium, uh, on, on, on education. So when they are having a social gathering, it is not even there. The agenda is sent to him and he put it in writing. The philosophical meaning in this proverb is that societies have to value education and in our policies we have to look at how we can uh, uh, embolden, as it were, educational policies here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, coming back to the main point, which is the issue of using technology in Africa, it has something to do with who is controlling the information and who is managing those information. Are we really the one who producing and exchange information, uh, or are just using all we are the one who produces it all itself? Nano is the Dam, who in touch at the telephone, the Hadisa, the Kamal Ala, the Gara, and Maluma. Then we exchange information, but we are not controlling them. Then there is so many issues there that we want to look very critical into it to see how to manage it. Thank you so much. I wish you a good day.